Hello, friends. So I'll be talking on this very broad topic, neuromuscular disorders in ICU. So I was meant to give this talk on 13th April 2024 in uh, NRA Medical College in Guntur in a course organized by Dr. Arif Pasha. So as you say, it's a very broad topic. So obviously, it's impossible to cover every neuromuscular disorder under the sun that happens in ICU in 20 minutes. So I've tried to give a brief overview with more detailed uh, uh, extrapolation on guillain barre syndrome, which is the common. So for all the audience who will be hearing to this, the commonest neuromuscular disorders that are seen in ICU for me is IC acquired weakness, which I'll talk about in detail. Then we need to have a general overview as to how we approach a neuromuscular weakness and guillain barre syndrome and myasthenia. These are the commoner ones. So, which is, which is what I'll try to cover. So, the topics that I would cover, as I said, with more emphasis on IC acquired weakness, because that is what we deal day in and day out. So, we'll look briefly into pathophysiology and the presentation of this IC acquired weakness, and what are the treatment modalities and prognosis. So, we'll talk brief, briefly on another new sort of a weakness that is emerging with the current sort of an interventions in ICU, which we'll talk in future trends. Then this is important how, because in exam, if they ask IQ acquired weakness, uh, one needs to have a comprehensive sort of a overview on how we approach the weakness based on whether motor neuron is affected, whether it is central causes, whether it is a motor neuron, I mean, whether it's a motor nerve causes or it's a neuromuscular junction or muscle causes. So that's the way we sort of differentiate the different types of pathologies occurring at different levels. So the differential diagnosis uh, for most listeners who are not from medicine background, so because in medicine we would have been dinned with these causes, central causes, motor neuron causes, peripheral neural neuro nerve causes, neuromuscular and muscular. This is how we classify the weaknesses that happen. And there are different pathologies which are very distinctively cause weakness by affecting one of these structures. And then I'll talk in little length about guillain barre syndrome, pathophysiology, what are the triggers, diagnosis, and treatment. So myasthenia, there wouldn't be any time, so I will do a separate video on myasthenia. Gladys. And I will take a message. So when you talk about ICU-acquired weakness, it is the weakness which patient did not have and develops in ICU in a critically ill patient. And this weakness, if it develops in ICU, can last for many months. And this weakness can be the reason for difficulty in weaning. And anyone who develops this weakness denotes the severity of underlying illness and is associated with worse outcome. And this weakness may be one of the reasons for difficulty in weaning of patients from the ventilator. So when we talk about ICU acquired weakness, and this can be definitely asked in exam, so you have to divide into three major categories. So one is critical illness polyneuropathy where only the peripheral nerves are affected. Seldom we see only isolated polyneuropathy or critical illness myopathy where only muscles are involved. But most often we see combination of these two. There is a complex interplay of neuropathy and myopathy which we call as critical illness myoneuropathy. So seldom we can delineate between these two and all, almost always they, are, they coexist or there is a overlap. And this IC acquired weakness has been known for more than 100 years, but it has gained prominence from 1970s to 1980s. So when we talk about the pathophysiology and, or the reasons for someone developing IC acquired weakness, so very schematically or pictorially I put it, and, and it is fairly intuitive for any intensivist that all the typical critically ill sort of a situation that affects the patient can be the trigger. So mainly the duration of mechanical ventilation. So the longer the patient is on ventilator, higher is the risk of them developing IC acquired weakness or malnutrition is a very important cause. Someone who uh, is ethanol alcohol dependent, they are also at a higher risk of developing. Or someone who has, I think the commonest cause of IC acquired weakness, which we see is patient with severe sepsis and multi-organ dysfunction. Someone who has a SMOD, they tend to develop more often uh, critical illness, myoneuropathy. Sepsis is uh, the common sort of a cause that we see in patients developing uh, critical illness, myoneuropathy, and ERDS also can cause. Someone who is on TPN, which typically denotes the sickness quotient of the patient, someone who has undergone complex surgical uh, procedure, or disuse atrophy, where there is no mobilization of the patient, patient is bed bound, 
deconditioned patient. So diffuse muscle atrophy is also common for cause. And someone with a underlying chronic disease condition like chronic liver disease, long-standing uncontrolled diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or end-stage renal disease on dialysis. These are someone who have a chronic underlying debilitating progressive disease. They are at a much higher risk of developing critical illness neuropathy. And someone who has been in sepsis or septic shock on very high vasopressors or who is receiving steroids for whatever reason and ARDS who may have received a lot of muscle relaxants, all these portend a risk of someone developing critical illness myoneuropathy. At a cellular level, there is a lot of microcirculatory dysfunction that happens and there is a lot of fluid sequestration within the muscles or within the tissues. All these are the risk for developing uh, critical illness neuropathy. So microcirculatory dysfunction and microcirculatory leakage is also one of the purported sort of a risk for critical illness. And there has been shown to be uh, sodium channels which tends to become inactive in critical illness, which is a risk for developing critical illness neuropathy. And there is mitochondrial dysfunction. So these are happen at a cellular level. So basically there is cellular injury leading to micro, mitochondrial dysfunction, inactive sodium channels and microcirculatory dysfunction. These are some of the elements that happen at the cellular level which leads to critical illness neuropathy. And when we talk about presentation, so it is fairly intuitive for every intensivist that the muscles will be weak. There won't be any anti-gravity movements. Patient will not be able to lift the hands and legs above the bed. And this weakness may be more profound in the proximal group. And there is hypotonia. Uh, so there is a wasting of the muscles and there is uh, hypotonia. And they can have a reflex here. So they will be absent of reflexes. So diagnosis basically is by electrodiagnostic by doing ENMG studies. In critical illness, polyneuropathy, compound muscle action potential and sensory nerve action potential, there is reduction in the amplitude. Uh, but it is very difficult to differentiate between pure critical illness polyneuropathy and critical illness myopathy, which I already said. There is some sort of an overlap between this and they tend to coexist. In critical illness myopathy, there is reduction in the amplitude and there is increase in the duration of the uh, action potentials. And uh, in critical illness myopathy, the recovery is better as opposed to critically ill, critically ill polyneuropathy. Myopathy have a better prognosis and recovery can take up to 6 to 12 months. So these are some of the little subtle differences between polyneuropathy and myopathy. And biopsy is the definitive way of establishing the diagnosis of critical illness myopathy. And with regards to CPK, uh, creatinine phosphokinase is normal in critical illness polyneuropathy because only nerves are affected. And this is one sort of a surrogate which can differentiate between myopathy. So if you are suspecting myopathy, CPK generally tends to be high in critical illness myopathy. So these are some of the subtle dif differences between electrodiagnostic features and with regards to the CPK levels. So with regards to treatment and prognosis, so there's no definitive treatment, but you have to minimize all the risk factors. So this study, this landmark study by Vandenberg has clearly shown that, that ineffective blood sugar control worsens the outcomes in critical illness uh, neuropathy. So good blood sugar level control is paramount in enhancing the recovery in critical illness neuropathy and try to stop or mitigate or avoid or reduce the duration of usage of TPN because TPN usage uh, proportionately has a risk of increasing the risk of uh, critical illness neuropathy and try to minimize the usage of over sedation, over analgesia or indiscriminate usage of neuromuscular blockers and try to as best as possible to your best efforts to wean off the steroids and not uh, not to keep the patient on protracted periods of steroids and obviously try to wean off the vasopressors by correcting the underlying cause and most importantly one important thing which has shown to improve the or enhance the recovery of critical illness myoneuropathy is early mobilization by aggressive physiotherapy and occupational therapy so this is a multi-dimensional sort of an approach towards enhancing the recovery process. I think the simplest thing that we can do is all the good ICU care, uh, try to keep the good blood sugar control, avoid the usage of TPN, avoid indiscriminate usage of neuromuscular blockers, over sedation, and, uh, and try to uh, wean off the vasopressors and so on and so forth. And the studies are very clearly why it is important that we have to enhance the recovery because 
the longer the patient is having a ICU acquired weakness, higher is the mortality. And this has been shown in studies that ICU acquired weakness have increased in the mortality. And ICU acquired weakness, 30% of them will have long-term disability in terms of inability to recover to their normal activities of daily living. So this was one study from the French group where they showed that if patients are on mechanical ventilator for more than seven days, in the group which develops ICU acquired weakness versus the group which did not develop ICU acquired weakness, the group which developed ICU acquired weakness had doubled the mortality, which means someone who's on ventilator for more than seven days, if a group does not develop ICU acquired, they have a better outcome as opposed to someone who develops ICU acquired weakness, the mortality is doubled. So that is something one needs to. So IC acquired weakness, is the organ dysfunction and it has an important bearing on the morbidity and mortality. So that's about in brief about ICU acquired weakness. With regards to future trends, the current sort of a uh, oversight is on the type of weaknesses that are developing due to the certain interventions, modern interventions we're doing. So compression of the peripheral nerves or traction of the peripheral nerves due to the pressure points is something that is being increasingly recognized especially with increasing proning of our patients due to ARDS. And this came in this paper where they have shown the proning is increasing the vulnerability of the patient to develop compression injuries due to the compression of the nerves and traction of the nerves, and especially brachial plexus injury and injury to ulnar nerve, radial nerve, sciatic and median nerve have been reported from various studies due to the prone positioning and due to other interventions. And due to increased use of ECMO, there is a new type of neuropathy that is shown which is mainly the femoral neuropathy. So this has been increasingly recognized in patients who are put on ECMO. So this is the newer sort of a observation that uh, we are doing in, in the context of certain interventions that we're doing, more so proning and ECMO. So now, how do we? So this is an important concept. If this ice acquired weakness is asked in exam, obviously we would talk about the first component, but approach to weakness or differential diagnosis, one could divide into the central cause motor neuron cause, peripheral nerve cause, and neuromuscular junction, and muscular causes. So when we talk about central causes, central causes mainly they've shown brainstem encephalitis or acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. All this can cause neuromuscular weakness in ICU or brainstem compression or leptomeningeal sort of a malignancy or tumor compression. So these are some of the central causes of, of neuromuscular weakness or transverse myelitis. So these are some of the central causes of causing neuromuscular weakness. When we talk about motor neuron, so this is how the motor neuron looks. So the common causes of motor neuron causes of neuromuscular weakness is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, spinomuscular atrophy, or some of the viral infections like rabies and polio. So these are known to affect the motor neuron causing neuromuscular weakness in ICU. And when it comes to peripheral nerves, which is more commonly seen, the commonest one is EIDP, uh, guillain barre syndrome, acute inflammatory demyelinating, which we'll talk in detail, and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, and vasculitis also is one of the reasons affecting the peripheral nerves, and critical illness neuropathy, which we discussed, porphyria affects the peripheral nerve, and tick paralysis affects the peripheral nerve, and heavy metal toxicity. So these are some of the causes which tend to affect mainly the peripheral nerves. When it comes to neuromuscular junction, the commonest one we see in ICU is myasthenia gravis, then the other conditions like eaton lambert syndrome or OP compound also affects the neuromuscular junction and botulism tends to affect neuromuscular. So these are some of the causes that affect the neuromuscular junction. And the conditions that affect the muscles are the typical myositis, polymyositis or drug-induced myopathy or mitochondrial myopathy or electrolyte or metabolic abnormalities. Rhabdomyolysis is also one of the commoner causes where muscle weakness can happen and critical illness, myopathy, which we address. So these are the broad overview for all the trainees. When a uh, ICU acquired or neuromuscular disorders are asked, you, you differentiate based on central causes, motor neuron causes, peripheral nerve causes, neuromuscular junction, and the muscle causes. And it's easy to remember if you keep these pictures in back of your mind. So we'll talk in little detail about guillain barre syndrome. So as I said, guillain barre syndrome causes symmetrical areflexia and symmetrical muscle weakness and there can be radicular pain that happens across the nerves that get affected and there is albumin albuminocytological differentiation where there is increase in the CSF proteins without increase in the cells. So this is a typical 
sort of a presentation of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So this can be asked in an exam. So Guillain-Barre syndrome mainly divided into two major categories, acute inflammatory demyelinating variant and axonal variant. The commoner ones can be any of these, but axonal is further subdivided into three types, acute motor axonal neuropathy, which is called AMAN. AMSAN is acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy. And the third one is miller feature variant. So this is the way guillain barre is classified. And subacute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, the progression can happen four to eight weeks. If it is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, the progression can happen more than two months. Paresthesias can be present in more than 15%. And many of these guillain barre syndromes can have autonomic dysfunction. So when you look at the pathophysiology of guillain barre this is a very beautiful curve. So why I'm putting these pictures is in exam, if this question is asked, just put this in a pictorial format, makes things easy for examiner also to under, to sort of a, uh, ascertain that you have a good conceptual understanding. So in pathophysiology, you see three curves. The red curve is the uh, infective sort of a phase where there is a trigger that has happened. It may, can be an infective trigger due to Campylobacter or other viral infections. And once the infection abates, then there is an autoimmune response to these infections, which tends to happen few days after the infection. And then there is a progression of the neuromuscular weakness, which tends to progress over a week, attains the plateau, and then the recovery phase happens over months, and which I will show you in some of the studies, how many months it will take. And, and, uh, and some of them would continue to remain, to have some sort of a debility or disability in the later phase also. So this is the typical progression. So you have three causes. One is the infective phase, second is autoimmune phase, and third is the disease progression, reaching plateau and recovery. And some of them continue to have residual sort of a disability, disability even for years. So that is something one can bear in mind. So for Guillain-Barre syndrome, traditionally you would have heard there's always a trigger. There is an antecedent cause or a trigger which is the cause for autoimmune process to be triggered. The commonest sort of a history we ask in guillain barre is whether they've had history of diarrhea. So because the one of the bugs that tends to have a high propensity of causing guillain barre is Campylobacter jejuni. Then there are a lot of viral infections like cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex virus, even Zika virus, even HIV virus. All these are known as triggers for causing guillain barre and then coronavirus also is postulated as one of the trigger for Guillain-Barre syndrome. And when it comes to bacteria, it's the Campylobacter jejuni causing diarrhea, which is a commonest culprit to trigger the Guillain-Barre. And even vasculitis like SLE can be a trigger for Guillain-Barre. And immunization on vaccine. In fact, we have reported one COVID immunization leading to having demyelination process. So any immunization has a remote potential risk of having this demyelinating process. So these are some of the commoners. So commoner antecedent or trigger will be always the viral infection. And when it comes to bacteria, keep Campylobacter jejuni in back of mind and some of the autoimmune conditions like SLA and immunization. So when we talk about pathogenesis, so in, this is a beautiful figure. You can try to put this figure in exam if they ask. Acute inflammatory demyelinating, it's not difficult to write this figure. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. As you say, this is the peripheral now. So you see the antibodies which are attacking the sort of a Schwann cells causing demyelination here. And here, this is the complement which tends to get activated. So there is a complement activation that happens. So basically, there are antibodies against the Schwann cells which leads to demyelination, uh, secondary to complement activation. And this complement activation leads to nerve injury. And after that, there is scavenging of all these uh, myelin sheets by these activated macrophages. So this is the typical pathogenesis that tends to happen. So very simply, you can write this diagram and show how the injury happens. In exonal, as you see, uh, there are antibodies provide, uh, which are triggered against the axon. So the yellow one is the axon. And then obviously there's a complement sort of an activation. And there is anti-ganglocide antibodies against these ones, GM1, GM1B, and GM1A, GD1A. So against these, and then there is a nerve injury and there is a scavenging of the uh, axon and the myelin sheath that tends to happen in axonal. So this is an axonal. In miller fascia variant, there are these antibodies which are developed against GQ1B, which occurs at this sort of a level, at the neuromuscular level. So this is the miller fissure variant which tends to happen. So this is the 
pathogenesis where there are specific antibodies against certain elements of uh, different nerve sheets. It can be the schwannomas or it, schwann cells or it can be at, for the axons or it can be at the GQ1B sort of a structure. So these are the antibodies that are identified. And uh, this is another just a pictorial representation. So there is a Campylobacter jejuni, then there's an antigen presenting cells, B cells get activated, and then there is a lot of cytokines, and then there are antibodies. And uh, uh, so there are these uh, antibodies and the cytokines that are produced. And there is this is axonal GBS, which is MN, so where antibodies are against this axon. And this is the demyelinating, where antibodies are against this uh, myelin. Myelin sheet. So this is just another pictorial representation of how there are different antibodies directed against different components of the nerve sheet. And the Miller phaser is against the GQ1B. So we'll talk a brief on Miller phaser variant. So we spoke about um, demyelinating neuropathy. We spoke about Amman, and we spoke about axonal neuropathy. So in Miller phaser variant, so there can be ataxia along with the typical symmetrical muscle weakness, areflexia, and albuminous cytoplasmosis, they can have central manifestations like ataxia and ophthalmoplegia in Miller phasia, and there is absent reflexes. So there is a variant of this called Bickerstaff encephalitis, where there is some sort of a brainstem involvement, which is called Bickerstaff variant of guillain barre So these are some of the uh, distinctive variants of guillain barre syndrome. When you talk about diagnostic criteria, as I said, you can. this is the Asbury's criteria, which is traditionally taught. But keep in mind that the key TNS is areflexia, symmetrical uh, muscular, neuromuscular weakness, and there can be some variant where there can be autonomic dysfunction, there can be sensory dysfunction, and there, there is albuminocytological differentiation. So these are the typical components of any GBS. So th this is put in various criteria, as is Asperis criteria. So when it comes to electrodiagnostic variant, so this is something you can just remember, there is something called H-wave and F-wave that tends to happen. And these are normal in uh, axonal. In demyelination, this H-wave and F-wave will be prolonged. And compound muscle action potential in axonal, it will be low. In demyelination, it will be normal. Conduction block is absent in axonal and it is present in demyelination. And temporal dispersion is absent in axonal and present in demyelination. And conduction velocity is normal in axonal and it is prolonged in demyelination. These are typical electrodiagnostic sort of a features of uh, GBS. So if you can remember, you remember, this is more from neurologist perspective, they would need to know. But in exams, we expect at least the basic, so you can at least remember what happens for conduction block, conduction velocity, and the compound muscle action potential. So this is something you can keep in mind. So that's about the diagnosis. So there is clinical element, there is investigative element, which is the albuminocytological, then there is electrodiagnostic sort of a cues to diagnose guillain barre syndrome. So when it comes to treatment, obviously they have to be kept in ICU and look for sort of a neuromuscular weakness, which is involving the bulbar muscles or respiratory muscles, which need mechanical ventilation. So these are the patients who need to be observed in ICU to look for any progression of the GBS. And uh, there is rule of uh, 40 where there is a maximum inspiratory pressure, rule of 20, 30, and 40. So where you have a vital capacity less than 20 and mean inspiratory pressure less than 30 and mean expiratory pressure more than 40 centimeters water, uh, which is a criteria for someone who will land up on a ventilator. So when it comes to therapeutic armamentarium, so there are two modalities, IVIG and plasma exchange. So we need to determine which is superior. So, summarily, all the studies have shown there is no difference between the IVIG and plasma exchange. Very quickly, I'll take you to the review. And most studies are old studies. This is the first study which came way back in Lancet in 1997, comparing IV immunoglobulins with plasma exchange and with combination of IVIG and plasma exchange. Here, as you see, this is the change in disability at four weeks. There was no difference. Either you use IVIG or plasma exchange or combination, there was no difference. And patients who required ventilation also, there was no difference between IVIG, plasma exchange or combination. And median days for discontinuation of mechanical ventilation also, there was no difference between IVIG, plasma exchange or the combination, there was no difference with regards to discontinuation of ventilation. And the median days for mobilization, so this is important, I just want to 
ऑडियंस पे लिटिल अटेंशन इन गिलन बारी सिंड्रोम द मीडियन डेज for the patient to get back to his walking status as you see is close to 2 months it's around 50 days as you see 40 to 50 days but there's no difference either you have so this study basically highlights what is the morbidity sort of a burden of gilan bari takes up to 50 days for them to walk independently after they suffer from gbs and median days to hospitalization discharge also there's no difference between the so which means to say either use igig plasma exchange or combination it did not make a difference so the easier way is to be in our hospital or most of them tend to give ivig at the front because of the ease of administration the plasma exchange you have to put a catheter dialysis catheter and it involves lot more logistics so the median days to resume their normal work this is also important for the all the listeners after someone has suffered from gbs the median days to get back to their work if you see it is almost close to a year 371 days 290 and 281 So ten to twelve months it takes for them to get back to their normal work, and but there is no difference between any of these three modalities. And there are certain group of patients who uh, remain immobile or who cannot walk independently, and that is up to fifteen percent of the patients with GBS don't resume their normal ability to walk independently. And death, of course, happened in a small group, around five percent of the patients. So there was no difference. So none of the clinical endpoints there was a difference. between ivig or plasma exchange or combination so after this the only sort of an evidence we have is this big cochrane review which came in around 2014 where again they took all the studies and compared between ivig and plasma exchange there was no difference they looked at disability improvement of more than one death or disability at one year there was no difference between ivig and plasma exchange ns is not significant as you see p is not significant they looked at relapse uh, and treatment fluctuation there was no difference and discontinuation and if you look at this discontinuation of the treatment happened more in patients who underwent plasma exchange obviously because of possibly complications associated with the vascular access and so on and so forth adverse events there was no difference uh, between the plasma exchange and ibig so basically if you look at cochrane and the studies there is no difference between plasma exchange or ibig and traditionally most neurologists in this day and age use ivig upfront because of the ease and you, that perfectly fine there's no difference so now coming to the last bit about whether there is role of steroids in gbs so summary like i can say there is no role of steroids in gbs so there's no new trials with regard to the role of steroids in gbs from 2009 there are six trials in, involving 587 patients and iv steroids were used in gbs in two trials and the the steroid they used was 500 mg methylprednisolone for 5 days one trial used steroid plus plasma exchange and compared versus plasma exchange there was no difference and one trial which which uh, pretty much most neurologists cite as a substantiation to use steroid is this which came from denmark where they used steroid plus ivig and this particular study came in lancet where they used effect of methylprednisolone when added to standard treatment with ivig for villan bari So here they use IVIG 0.4 grams per kg per day for five days with 500 mg methylprednisolone and compared versus IVIG. So 233 patients and they found as you see improvement in the disability happened in 68 percent when they used methylprednisolone along with IVIG as compared to 56 percent where they used IVIG It did not attain statistical significance. So in this particular trial by the Danish group they did a statistical tweaking and they did a age adjustment and they subdivided into two age groups less than 50 and more than 50 and then they attained statistical significance when they adjusted for the age the ivig with methylprednisolone had a better outcome with regards to improvement in disability and that attained statistical significance but after this again the cochrane review was done by who in 2016 here again they showed in fact this particular meta analysis showed they took six studies with 587 patients and they looked at change in disability at four weeks in fact they showed with the use of steroids they had a worse outcome although it did not attain statistical because p is not significant but they did have a worse because the change in disability was 0.36 points lower and the change in disability at four weeks was 0.82 lower which means even with oral steroid they had a worse sort of an outcome although it did not attain statistical significance then they did a subgroup with iv and oral steroid with iv steroid steroid had some better improvement but again none of them attained statistical significance because it was 0.17 points 
higher. So basically, this meta-analysis says that addition of steroids really did not make any difference with regard to outcome. Rather, it became worse in when they gave oral steroids on the overall steroid group. And improvement more than one grade, again, there was no difference between the steroid group. And death or disability also, there was no difference between the steroid and the control group, as you see, so it's not statistically significant. But when they look at adverse events, the steroid group had more significant adverse events, and that was statistically significant. And, uh, and diabetes occurred more in steroid group. And when they looked at the hypertension as an adverse event, surprisingly, they found hypertension happened more in the control group as opposed to the steroid group. So that's about the evidence for stress. So summarily, steroids has no role. In fact, it can worsen the outcomes uh, with regards to improvement in the disability. There was a worse outcome with steroids and adverse events were more in the steroid group is what we can decipher. Then there was an editorial by uh, this guy called Rossi et al. in Lancet where there was some sort of a uh, scientific plausibility that one has to delineate between demyelinating and axonal sort of a uh, gillen barre syndrome because the type of antibodies that are generated against this uh, may respond to the steroids. So they did a small study in 16 patients where they divided between axonal and demyelinating and they checked the antibodies level and they found in the axonal type there was high titers of GM1 antibodies and they believe that giving steroids in this group may be beneficial. Here they gave IVIG with methylprednisolone and all of them improved. So maybe this editorial points towards scientific plausibility. There is a separate subgroup of patients where your antibody levels are high, like I, against certain uh, now cells like myelin sheath. So if you have a high titers of IgG GM1 antibodies, perhaps use of steroids may be beneficial. So there may be some subgroup, some phenotype that we may have to recognize and identify which may respond to steroids. Otherwise, all in all, if you're not doing this antibodies level and uh, doing it, doing a blanket therapy of steroids may not hold promise at this point of time. So if you are doing some sort of a research, taking the antibodies and if you have a high titers, maybe that group may benefit from steroids is what we can conclude. So that's about the overview. So I spoke about ICO acquired weakness. Then I spoke about the general sort of a overview of the neuromuscular disorders. Then I spoke at length with regards to how we approach the guillain barre syndrome, the diagnostic tools, the therapeutic options and so on and so forth. So I had to cover my screen agreement. Obviously, we have run out of time. So I will do it in a separate video and I will upload it on my website. So thank you one and all. So I request all of you to attend our signature conference, Global Intensive Care Symposium from 17 to 18th October. And request all our listeners to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. So thank you. Thank you one and all.